panelists are meeting each other. There are two microphones so that when it comes time, you know, again, it's an honor to <coughs> and that you're going to pass them along. Sounds great. Thanks, Lori. All right, now i got to get this one working. All right. Hi, everyone. So that was fantastic. Thank you so much for, for that. And I feel like that was such a perfect framework going into this topic of youth voice right now. Like that, that was fantastic. So we couldn't have asked for a better segue into, into our topic for this panel. Um, I'm really excited to kick off our first panel today with this topic of youth voice. Um, I have been so inspired by youth across the country in recent years in their advocacy, in their way for speaking up um, for themselves, for their peers, for the issues that they are all fighting for. You know, I mean, we saw that in Florida as well with Douglas High after the shooting. You know, and we just, we see that all of the time in history that youth are the ones that are really making change in this country. So how are we as theater companies working with youth to empower them to continue to make that change, not just in society and in their worlds, but also within our own theaters. Um, so I'm really interested in that, that question. Um, as our theater continues to centralize education and engagement programming as core to our missions and our visions, how are we representing youth voice at those tables? As we strive to create safe and brave spaces for youth at our theaters in the world of Me Too, we need to listen to them. As we make decisions and uh, how we responsibly hold that space for those youth. And how are we making the decisions with them rather than just for them. I hope to start here to um, put forth youth voice front and center as we continue on our day um, to discuss trauma-informed care and safety. I think this is a great flow to, to this um, whole day together. And let's consider in these conversations how we will take this work back to our own theaters and be more responsible when we do invite youth to the table then for these dialogues. I'm thrilled to have a wonderful panel here. This is really exciting to me. <laughs> um, I think that each person here has a really unique voice, a unique role at their institutions. Um, and I think they're gonna be bringing a lot to the table for, for this, this conversation. Um, so why don't we just start with having you all introduce yourselves, the role that you have, as well as the institution that you are with. Hello, uh, my name is Abby Thompson, and I'm finishing up uh, my degree at Columbia College Chicago, and I'm an alumni of Milwaukee Repertory Theater's Teen Council. Hi, my name is Natalie Hirsch. I'm the artistic director of the 52nd Street Project, which is located in New York City, and it's an after-school arts program for young people and professional artists. My name is Viet Cato. I'm the pro programs manager for Old Globe in San Diego. Hi, my name is Rachel Fink, and I'm the executive director of Looking Glass Theatre Company. Hello, my name is Victoria Rotraster, and I am the director of education and family programming at Miami Theatre Center. Wonderful. Um, so something that really excites me about this panel is the variety of roles that each person has, as well as the vast array of programs that we are all involved with. One of the questions in the description for this session is around the extent to which youth are being given decision-making powers and involvement at your theaters. Um, so Natalie, I'm actually going to start with you in 52nd Street Project. Um, I think you've done some amazing work in creating space for youth to co-create with professional artists. Can you speak a bit about that process and how youth are involved throughout it? Sure, yeah. Um, so just a little back round about the 52nd Street Project. So we're a nonprofit in Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of uh, New York City, and um, we provide free programming for young people ages 9 to 18. And the way every program works is that it's a collaboration with our young people and um, professional artists um, who volunteer their time. So um, to start, the, all of our programs are collaborative, but to start to get a sense of what we do is that um, our nine or 10 year olds come in and they take a playmaking class, which is essentially playwriting, teaching them how to write a play. And um, we, we teach them the basic structure of a play, 
want conflict and change are the three main ingredients we teach them. And then we have them write an original piece of theater. We do not touch content at all. Um, we let them take it wherever they want to take it. And um, each young person is paired with two professional actors and a director. And so that one person is, one young person is working with three professional adult artists to help fully realize their play. And then we fully produce it in our theater. And um, we take it really, really seriously. And so, yes, they're nine and 10 year olds writing these plays. So there's often you think, you know, they're writing about monsters or unicorns. But um, the content is actually really interesting and I think really important because, for example, this last round, a young person wrote about a superhero whose dad just died, and the only thing he had left was his dad's guitar. And um, this young girl who wrote this, her father had just moved out, and he came to the play, to the show, and just sobbed the whole time and realized that there is a connection, and that's their way of expressing themselves through superheroes. So um, that's kind of the start of how we do everything, um, the, how we do our programs, but um, the way every other program that we, that we do works is that we are pairing a young person with an adult professional no matter what. So if it's our dance program, we pair a young person with an adult artist and we teach them basic movements, how to move their body, but then the young person creates um, or choreographs an original piece of theater that the two of them perform together. So every step of the way, the young person has a complete creative say or creative collaboration with their partner, and the partner is not there to teach them, it's really just there to support and guide and um, go on this path together. So that's a little bit about how we try and really make sure that the young person's um, voice, creative voice, is in every process, even if it's something new to them, like dancing or like writing. How long has that structure been in place at your theater? Um, the project, the 52nd Street Project, we call it the project, um, we've been around, 38 years, um, but the play, I think the playmaking program started about 30 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. And there's actually a book. Um, the man who created it is a man named Daniel Judah Sklar, and there is a book about playmaking out there. I think it's called Playmaking. Um, and it teaches you the steps of how to teach them the basics of writing, but then also how to balance the structure of a play but giving them cr complete creative freedom, or content freedom, yeah. That's fantastic. Do you find that the structure has changed you know, throughout the years, or has it been uh, adapted at all in recent years? Um, I think, I don't think the structure has changed. I think we are always aware of content. Like the one thing that is always a little tricky is making sure again, which I'm sure we'll talk about later today, is the safety of the young person. So when they write something that might feel scary or um, concerning, we make sure, we, we used to have, this something that I related to, we off and on have a social worker working with our organization. Um, and sometimes it's really useful and sometimes it's, we always lose that balance of what, what how much do we support them therapeutically. Um, but the one thing that I always try and talk to my young person about when, especially lately, is that I never want to censor anything they write because I think it's really important for them to feel complete ownership over it, but I always remind them that this is going to be per, um, performed by a big, uh, a big audience that's going to come to the show and just reminding them how would that, how is it going to make you feel when this information is performed to a lot of people. So I think content has a bit, been a little, I think, because the time, the nine-year-olds feel what's going on in the climate too as much as we do. So I think the content has gotten a little darker maybe. Um, and I think we're just trying to negotiate and navigate how to still support them and let them feel like they have complete agency over the work, but not let them ever feel unsafe when their work is performed on stage. That's great, thank you. Um, so staying on the artistic creation side, uh, Victoria, Miami Theater Center also has a program in which youth write and produce their plays, correct? Yes, can that's you, correct. Yeah. So can you describe that program, that process, and how youth are engaged from the beginning? Yes, and I will just start by saying that my first ever um, job in the United States, New York City, was at the 52nd Street Project. Uh, and that's where I started. I was volunteering. I, wasn't, I didn't have my green card yet, and I was volunteering. And um, seeing that program from the inside out was absolutely incredible and so inspiring. And I literally took so many things from that program into the rest of the positions and jobs that I held. 
So thank you guys for that. The model is really incredible and you should all check it out if you have those programs. Um, but yes, we have two main programs that we have um, where decision-making, youth decision-making is really at the core. And one is during the term time, which is a play, uh, playwriting residency in schools um, that is a similar model, uh, except it's a little bit different, is that the, uh, the kids work with their classroom teacher and work in groups to write their own plays, but they are performed by our ensemble of teaching artists on the stage for them, and that's in schools. Um, and it's very similar where we give them stimulus um, to create characters such as images, maps, letters, that sort of thing. And then over a six-week session, um, in partnership with their classroom teacher, they write um, small group plays. So that's the one um, element. And then a second um, program that we have is during our summer program, which is our musical theatre summer camps, uh, which are just about to begin next week because our kids finish up. Uh, this is their last week of school here in South Florida. And um, again, decision making is at the core of it. There are three week sessions and we give them a theme and it can be from, you know, superheroes um, and then kindness or um, ancient Greece and bravery and courage or fairy tale and advocacy uh, change, you know, whatever the themes are of that um, year. And, um, and then with their teaching artists, they create character, script, costume, set. The older groups actually also tech their own shows um, as well as operate front of house. So at the end of the three week session, the family and friends and the local community invited in to see their shows and they are literally operating every part of the show, uh, which is also incredible. Um, the, the groups stay with their two teaching artists, their local teaching artists, professional actors and playwrights and dancers uh, from Miami. And then during the, the course of their day, while they're writing on their, working on their plays, they will also go to specialized master teachers who will work on the dance number or work on, you know, with a, with a choreographer, or they may work on their musical number with a, um, you know, a composer. So throughout the day, it's broken up where they're constantly working on their play, but with different people to get a different view. Um, and then I should just say for our playwriting residency in schools, um, the head of that residency is local playwright Carmen Plays, who's going to be, I think, presenting at one of the panels during this conference. She just uh, had her amazing play produced at Miami uh, New Drama here. So she's very, very well known in the community. So we try and access, um, you know, while we don't act, we try and access local Miami working professionals that really are interested in working with youth and young people, but also making sure that they understand that these, these are the kids, they decide what they do. You know, very similar to what you were saying, you know, sometimes they don't, sometimes they've got it in their mind what they want the kids to do, and it's gonna be great, and we're gonna do this, and we're, no, actually, you know, if they write, if they write a play about a ball of bubble gum chasing a goat, then that, that's going to be the play. And they're like, what? You know, and, but very interesting, just talking about the change, uh, we had a group this um, last season, it was part of our playwriting program, um, and the kids were a little bit older, but I noticed the change with the climate. They wrote about um, all the, the play was about the national monuments throughout the United States going missing. And um, the, the, the trial of the play, uh, and the protagonist was the American Eagle, who was very upset with the way that these that things were changing. So it's just interesting that the, you know, and this this absolutely came from them. So it was just it's interesting how you say you know kids pick up on everything, they hear everything, they feel everything, and so we really try and represent that in all of our programs. That's fantastic. So how long have those those programs been in existence then? So um, Miami Theatre Centre, interesting enough, uh, three seasons ago, we went through a huge transition and we went from a producing house to a presenting house. So um, I was brought in as education director. So we during our main season, we present uh, four to six uh, TYA focused uh, theatre companies or dance companies, music concerts from around the world, from around the country. And then the education programs, everything that we do is related to whatever's on our stage. So we'll bring these groups in to see a live performance as inspiration, or we'll, you know, whatever we do, we'll expose them to pieces of visual art, whatever it is. So those are, this is our third season running that program. Um, and uh, what was the other part of the question? Just how long these programs have been. Yeah, so this is, this is the third season. Now our musical theater summer camps, they've been running for nine years. 
Uh, our camp director, um, Art Garcia, is in absolutely insanely, incredibly talented. People know his name, they come to work with him in his summer camps. And you know, and I think one of the main reasons is because he gives agency over to the young people and they really do create their own work. That's great, that's great. Um, so as we've talked about as well already, we've seen how the world is seemingly rapidly changing these days, um, as is the role of education and engagement programming in our theaters. Um, Vieka, I think you have a really interesting position. Um, I'm kind of going in the order of our call. <laughs> um, uh, you have a really interesting position where you had a huge transition at the Old Globe from uh, um, almost not dismantling the education programming, but the department transition more into the engagement side and overseeing that. Can you talk a bit about that transition and how did that impact the education programming itself? And uh, were youth a part of that dialogue at all or how did that become part of that influence? Yes, thank you. So uh, earlier I forgot to mention that I'm part of the uh, arts engagement department. And it's a fairly new department, I'd say three to four years old. And prior to that, we were the education department. And so I think the main difference between that is the interactiveness with the community. Uh, before, we were providing a lot of educational programming, and we were pri providing a lot of one-way type uh, programs like the student matinee programs where we bring the students onto our campus and uh, we also had a studio program where we would bring an ensemble cast of students in about 32 to uh, be part of a production and act on our stages. Well we've kind of transitioned into making it more a uh, studio for example a devised piece where the students kind of have a collaboration between the Shakespeare's work and then putting in and inserting their reflections and that becomes the piece itself and so uh, it's really a way to give them a platform and we literally give them a platform a stage to provide their uh, creative pieces and it's really empowering to them because it's no longer us dictating and directing a play it's them uh, curating it themselves and yes we do bring professionals in such as uh, fight choreographers and music directors and movement directors and such to uh, make it a more professional piece but really it is theirs uh, we also have another program uh, where it is school in the park and what that is, is when the students come in, they also interact with Shakespeare, something that we do. Uh, they also interact with the Shakespeare piece, but uh, they also are given components on how to write their own poems, how to write their own pieces, and then they share it. We call it peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And uh, for them to provide these vulnerable pieces in front of their peers is just really empowering because they, uh, might be really quiet in the in the classroom and then once they get to our space they feel they have a safe space to um, be more themselves and uh, that's a really beautiful thing to watch unfold and so which th with the education department we still provide some kind of educational programming but now we've grown very quickly I might add to having 20 plus programs uh, that span from community engagement where we're out in the community providing playwriting classes uh, to multi-generational communities um, to uh, bringing p more and more students onto the campus for uh, programs and working more with volunteers of all ages. That's great. So you also talked on our call about a program that you do with incarcerated youth, is that correct? So we have a program called Reflecting Shakespeare which is now going to be in um, uh, Donovan and also we are currently in um, Sentinella uh, Federal Prison and so we provide the inmates a space to um, also be in the play but also put their reflections in also something that we've brought into studio um, and so right now we are definitely trying to uh, promote that amongst uh, the uh, youth who are incarcerated in San Diego and giving them that space and uh, growing that program. It's still in its uh, early stages of planning, but that's the goal that we have. Um, and we're slowly expanding. Uh, we started with just a handful, I say three people when we were the education department, and now we've grown to a staff of 10 plus 20 teaching artists and um, uh, a marketing person who helps uh, split her time between the PR and marketing as, uh, side of it and then us. And so we're really trying to create a sustainable program um, and grow at a, at a rate where development can keep up with us, but also still provide free programming for everybody. And so it's kind of a, a chicken and egg kind of situation, but we want to keep that going. And we don't want to cut programs and figure out where we can trim the fat. We kind of want to figure out how we can keep everything, all the good work that we've been doing going. Great, excellent. Um, so 
transitioning over to a bit of teen councils, and I'm going to go to you next, Rachel, here. Um, they have become more and more popular as a way to bring youth voice into the theater. Um, and we actually have 12 teenagers across four different theaters that will be joining us for the conference tomorrow. So, and a lot of them are coming in right now. Um, I just got a text a few minutes ago from <laughs> with a picture of my teens at the airport. <laughs> um, but Rachel, um, your design of the program when you were formerly at Berkeley Rep um, has really been an inspiration to many people who have designed these programs across our theaters. And it was a model of us that we were all inspired by. Since then, Rachel has transitioned into executive leadership and is now at Looking Glass. Um, I would love to hear from you about that role shift from you from education into executive leadership mm -hmm. and how that value of youth voice has carried over into a, a very different role. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for that. That's so sweet. Um, teen Council was uh, something that uh, was and is near and dear to my heart, so um, that was very sweet of you. Uh, you know, when I started, I was at Berkeley Rep. I started in 2000. We started the Teen Council in, uh, what was it, Joanne, 2001, 2002? Yeah, so like, and, and what I'll say is that when we started then, it was not that different from what I'm experiencing now going to a whole new institution because so much of it is about creating um, a, a culture that embraces youth and youth voice. So while like there is, there's the piece of it that all everyone on the panel is talking about in terms of creating these really dynamic, engaging programming that um, fits the needs of the youth as well as the community. There's also the um, uh, the structure that it fits within. And so I remember starting at Berkeley Rep, and it was at a time when we were building a new theater, and everyone was terrified about having teenagers come in, and they're going to rip up the seats, and oh my God, they're going to spray paint the bathrooms, and so like there was a I'm not kidding, um, <laughs> there there was a uh, a long process in terms of creating space, building trust. Uh, kind of saying, you know what, tough, this is what this program needs to be, and we're just going to show you that it's going to be okay and we can trust these kids because they're amazing. Uh, and that really took time and effort and love and care um, from a whole variety of stakeholders. Um, and to the extent I was um, ha at, at, right before the beginning of the session talking to Rachel Hull, who's now the director of Berkeley Rep, and she was telling me how the artistic director was uh, talking to the, the current artistic, artistic director was talking to the kids recently um, and saying how much a part of the um, culture of Berkeley Rep is the teen council and it's about having a full integration across the organization. So, um, so that, I had that experience, it was in my body, and um, I'm, but wanting to have a, a change in my own career and wanting to run a, a company and work in collaboration with artists, um, moved to Looking Glass, uh, which had a, and has a, a long tradition of working with youth, uh, and, but in a, I would say, a more traditional sense in terms of um, having resident teaching artists going out into the classroom uh, and that has been celebrated, but not a fully integrated space for uh, teenagers. And I was like, oh, well, I remember this. <laughs> like, I, oh, right. Like, I, you know, the, the thought of, well, where, where are the teens? Where are we having, wh where is their voice? How are we both training and mentoring the next generation at the same time as we're doing the work? Because something that I learned from the years of doing teen council is that it actually, um, and I found this in any type of mentoring, it makes me better at my job. Because if you're constantly being questioned of why to do something, you can't take it for granted. And you're challenged to always rethink and re-question the choices that you're making. And so it's something that I also em embraced in my leadership. So, um, you know, we're at the beginning stages now uh, of Looking Glass, of, of figuring out what is the equivalent of um, really integrated youth voice into the organization. There's definitely space where they're creating work kind of similar to what other people have talked about, but, uh, you know, our challenge, and this is a new challenge um, uh, for me, is, is um, while we love our space, we're very grateful for our space, we're in um, a public utility, 
we're in the water pumping station on Michigan Avenue, which has a lot of baggage attached to it. We are in uh, one of the most uh, um, affluent areas of Chicago. It is a, sh a high-end shopping district, um, and our building looks like a castle. It literally, like you could, ha it looks like you need a moat around it. So if you're thinking about trying to create a welcoming space um, and a space where youth and teens have ownership and a voice, which is what all of this is about, it is a space that is screaming the exact opposite. Um, and, you know, then we are dealing with the politics of Chicago and of, um, uh, we're in a space where we regularly get updates from the Michigan Mile Association or from our landlords of, oh, be careful, there's a group of teenagers who are coming on public transportation and going to be on Mag Mile, so watch out. So, as, yeah, so uh, as staff, we're having conversations, well, we don't feel really comfortable about that, so what are we going to do? How are we going to make this space be a place where teens can feel like they can be themselves, that they can engage with art, where it is a place where they belong, where you know they may be different than the person sitting next to him, next to them, and that is okay. Um, and so, in some ways, it's really interesting because uh, I did not fully appreciate, and it sounds stupid to say it out loud, but I'll still say it. Um, the amount of power and privilege that I had as an executive director going into the space to say, oh, but no, we're going to really change this. This is really different. And, um, and used to being uh, in a space where you had to build so much buy-in and you had to do that work, and knowing that that's certainly important because, um, you know, I want people to actually do something because they... Uh, believe it's important not because the boss told them to but that there is a little there is a certain amount of no I'm just gonna rip off the band-aid and we're gonna make sure that we're gonna say that this is okay and figure out the steps of doing it and yeah there's gonna be parts that are messy um, and we'll learn from that and we'll have our eyes wide open and we'll keep on talking about it um, but that that has been like one of the one of the big transitions and change so I'll say that you know I've been at Looking Glass for a year so we are in the beginnings of it um, but it's something that is exciting and I think incredibly, incredibly important both for youth work, um, but also just for the health, vitality, and sustainability of the organization. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, what would a panel on youth voice be without a young adult at the table? <laughs> um, so I first met Abby when she attended one of our teen council's teen nights, I think before you were even in high school. Yeah. Um, I think I was like 13, <laughs> She was maybe, very yeah. young. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she very quickly got um, involved with our programming. Um, she became an intern at Milwaukee Repertory Theater. She became our teen council president. Um, she was also highly involved with all of the other theaters in town as well. Um, so she was a very, very busy youth, and she remains busy in her <laughs> college years right now um, and uh, is involved in multiple theaters still. Um, she also attended TCG in Washington, D.C. Um, as a member of Ooh. Teen Council. Um, so it's really exciting to have her on this panel. Um, and one of the questions that I have that I'd love to hear from you, because you've continued your involvement in various theater companies, mm -hmm. not just with Milwaukee Rep, of course. Um, you know, how, how do you feel that um, your experiences as a youth, where do you feel that your voice was included in the decision-making process at any of these theaters, mm -hmm. and how does it inform you today? Um, well, something that was really unique about Milwaukee Rep that I was just speaking to Vieka about this morning is the transition between like doing children's theater and adulthood. Like the rep definitely specifically really was there in that in-between stage when I was looking at colleges, when I was prepping my resume, when I was learning about the adult world. Um, so Teen Council specifically, I think really not only empowered my voice and gave me the chance to be able to learn about all these things and, and have a voice in these things, but really prepped me for that adult world and prepped me for college 
college in so many ways, um, in some ways that were even more than my high school did. Um, and I went to an arts high school, so I was getting like double dipping. Um, but something that Teen Council specifically um, did for me was really like the administrative side and the behind the scenes and learning about the education department. Um, and Viet Ken and I were talking. I'm also a teaching artist in Chicago um, and in Milwaukee and for the rep. Um, and so and something I didn't even know that teaching artistry was a thing or what that was or what an education department was um, until um, until I really joined the Teen Council and really got to see that side of things. I grew up doing professional children's theater. I grew up doing shows at church and at school, and, um, but seeing that education side of things, and I used to joke that like, I kind of had like, resistance to education because I have a lot of professors in my family. Um, and my dad's a professor, and my grandma's a professor, and so I kind of joked. I loved working with kids, um, but I knew I didn't want to be like a traditional classroom teacher, but I loved working with kids, and I was constantly finding myself doing it since a young age. Um, so discovering that theaters have an education department was a brand new concept to me um, that I'd been around my entire life, but I'd never seen the inside workings. Like I had teaching artists come to my school when I was younger, and I don't think I even fully realized what that was or what they were doing for me, and that that was a career and something that I could go into more. Um, so that's something that the rep in particular really exposed me to. That and arts advocacy, um, which TCG was the first them taking me to TCG. Um, we also went to a conference in Madison, Wisconsin, in our capital, and did some arts advocacy there. Um, so that whole world was open to me that I didn't even know existed or that I kind of had snippets of, but really connecting the dots and helping with that transition um, between being a child and, and children's theater to adulthood. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So from your experiences with, with each of these theaters as well, what do you think theaters could even do more of in terms of youth voice and in, in terms of like program design, not just, again, we heard a lot about um, how youth are involved and their voices are heard within specific programs, mm -hmm. but how about that development of those programs? Yeah. Where do you feel that, that um, those voices could be really beneficial? Yeah. Um, something that I think is super beneficial that I had the privilege of having kind of, um, I guess, um, informally, but I think could be done more formally, is the idea of mentorship. I think I had kind of a natural mentorship through the rep, and I just kind of naturally was at that point in time, um, and as someone who's always like seeking and, and following uh, and wanting to learn things, so I think that was very informal, but I think having a more formal structure of mentorship, not only just um, professional to student or to youth, but um, youth on youth and peer on peer, um, and the former president of Teen Council right after me, um, her and I still remain friends to this day, and we were talking about this, having this conversation um, about really that importance of having a mentor that's in similar age in you, that's only a few years older than you, because they're those next steps. They're the people that are gonna be there, or they're the people that have just been where you are right now and where you're going. Um, so having that, those different levels of mentorship, not only professional to youth, but really just um, having, having interns, maybe working with the interns, and that's something that Again, I kind of, I think our teen council has been acquiring and we kind of acquired informally because we were so excited, like, oh, the interns, they're in college or they're fresh out of college, we wanna know what they're doing and ask them questions. But having in place more structures, like more panels, more um, meet and greets and um, interviews, shadowing, I think shadowing is super important. Again, something that I did kind of informally throughout the years through interning and, and just asking questions, but having more of a structure and more of an openness so that teens know that's an option and youth know, oh, I really wanna try this. Um, like when I interned for the rep, I'd never done sound before. And my internship was more education and administrative based, but I think at one point I just said like, Jenny, I really wanna run sound, I've never done it. Um, and then the next thing I know, I was in the booth learning how to run sound. Um, so, and that's, and I'm primarily an actor, so that was totally new territory for me. Um, but really just making that known that that's an option and having more of a structure in place to do shadowing, um, to ask questions, to do resume prep. Again, something informal that was done um, by a lot of my mentors at the rep were having them look at my resume and give me feedback, having them help me with interviews, um, having them help me search for opportunities for future summers so that I could have the opportunity to go to other theater companies and intern and dip my toe in the water in different fields um, and just showing me where those resources are, taking me to TCG, um, prepping us for the conference before we even went, talking about the sessions and what we're gonna experience and goals that we have in mind. So all of these things kind of happened, I feel like for me, pretty informally, but having more of a structure of that mentorship um, and shadowing, it's really important. Great. Um, so turning it back to this idea again of youth voice within our programs, 
Um, I thought there was an interesting uh, uh, question that I keep coming back to is where do we begin this process? Where do we, when do we invite youth to the table? So I know after that TCG conference in Chicago where the first time that the teens were all there where we all went, oh, we all need this at our theaters. You know, that ended up being a, like, how do we start this? How do we begin this, right? And we happened to do a summer program at the time and we invited those youth from that summer program and said, hey, there was this thing that we learned about how do we shape this? How do you want this shaped? And even recently, like after you know, um, Abby graduated too out of the program, we have a whole new group of teens that have looked at all of the plans that these teens went through and they went, yeah, we're not actually interested in this stuff. I'm like, what, what? really? <laughs> you know? So like, these are the things that we really want, and these are the things that would, would actually help us. So I thought that was fascinating, too, of like, whoa. So the years of building these programs with youth, once we get new voices in, they need to shift and having that flexibility to be able to do that. Um, we also have an after-school program that has been very youth-centric and around community-engaged work with youth in relationship to our productions as well as the neighborhoods in which these programs are occurring. And it's been floundering. It's been, it, we've struggled with attendance, with retention, with getting the youth to stay. And now granted, most of our programs are for teenagers, so it's really difficult to get teenagers to stay after school when they have so many different responsibilities. Um, so we have youth leaders that we've hired now as part-time employees of the rep, and we have them giving us information and uh, helping with, um, you know, just surveying their peers and talking to them about how do we make sure that this program is sustainable and we've actually come to the decision that it's just not you know that we're gonna have to cancel this program um, so we've we're ending this program but in these conversations we knew that we needed to replace it with something informed by what those youth were saying um, at the time we were doing a lot of research on August Wilson monologue competition and uh, we were able to apply for that with their voices at that table um, and that's the reason why we've applied for that shadow year we're starting that shadow year next year so it's going to be a huge learning process there. But even with what are we doing in that shadow year? What is the programming elements? We have have the youth leaders from those after school programs as well as from our teen council who are at that table with youth serving organizations that we would be partnering with and schools and teachers to be able to say, okay, what is it that we want to do and what is it that's going to best serve the youth today? And knowing that in two years, those youth are going to graduate and we're going to be <laughs> at that table again asking those same questions of what is it going to be this year now um, so that was a really long introduction into that original question of when do youth become involved in that process you know how how do they influence the program design not just the content of a program and that's for all of you so I'll speak um, so it's something I think about all the time, and I <laughs> grapple with all the time. So um, I've been at the 52nd Street Project for five years, and I've been artistic director two years. And this organization's been around for 30 plus years. And so one of our programs is our teen ensemble, which is a two-year program when um, our teens um, can, they opt to be part of it or not. It's totally their choice. Um, and you start around, if you're a sophomore or junior, anyone who's a member will is invited to join the teen ensemble. And so the history of the project, um, the second year of the teen ensemble was always a, a bridge Shakespeare show. So they would put on a 90 minute Shakespeare show and make it contemporary. And, um, and so for my first two rounds of the teen ensemble, that's what we did and um, it wasn't working and it was really, really hard. And um, because at, while I, I'm not knocking Shakespeare at all, love him, um, <laughs> not knocking him, but it just wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't working for our teens. And I was like, what, what's going on here? And I, I had to reflect on it and think that, so our, all of our programming, while we, it's all theater based, we are not, we're not here to produce or make, Actors. These are we're, the theater is there for other skills to build their self-esteem and their sense of self-worth and community and um, their creativity. But we're not here to make actors. So um, this last round of teens, 
we did um, the program before that is our what we call our two on twos, where the teens we put them into groups of about two or three or four, and a playwright comes and meets with our teens and gets to know them and then writes an original piece of the a short original piece of theater for them, and this round of those plays were very personal to our teens and they were so excited because they were political, and um, each teen like re really related to the character in a way that a lot, often our plays are very abstract and not as connected to them. And so they, we witnessed them loving the fact that they were playing um, things that were close to their hearts. So I, for the first time, had to step out with my associate artistic director and we were like, we're not doing Shakespeare next year. We're gonna devise an original piece of theater based on their, what they're interested in. And it was really scary to have to do that shift because here I am the new artistic director with this history, which I really respect and value. And so I asked my colleagues who had been there longer, why do we do Shakespeare? Why, why is this what we do for their second year? And it, the main request, answer was, that's what we've always done. And, and then I was like, okay, this is gonna be scary, but we're gonna do something completely different. And um, based on what we watched happen with our teens, and so here we are, it's June 4th. We have a show in our original devised piece of theater that we'll do for the first time is happening in two, three weeks. Um, and we're all scared. <laughs> and we're all really excited, but it's also the first time that I've seen, this is my third round of Teen Ensemble, and I've never seen the young people show up so often. Um, they're not as flaky as they used to. I mean, teens are always gonna be a little flaky. Um, <laughs> but they're not as flaky as they used to be. They're way more responsible and we're holding them accountable. Like, we can't do this piece if you're not in the, if you're not in rehearsal, we can't finish this because we need your, not just your body, but your words and your thoughts and your ideas. Um, so um, I've never seen so many of them return every, every class and be really more on it and, sh and communicate when they're not gonna show up. And it's usually for, like prom or uh, I have to take this exam. So it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a hard transition, especially with a long standing organization, but to try and really listen. And I'm now like, how am I gonna do this with every other program? I gotta reflect on every single program and bring them at the end of each program, bring them back and be like, what worked for you? What didn't work for you? Okay, but it's, it's an ongoing battle and struggle and it's also really exciting too. So something uh, that I think comes from the teens, uh, there's a story of, of, of show that we did a little bit ago where uh, we were talking about the first female astronauts and one of the artists' uh, children were watching it and they were little girls and they did not understand why sexism existed. They didn't understand why there was this unfairness. And I think what that says to us is this perfect world that we're working toward already kind of exists in the minds of these young children. And we live in this world where we're trying to make sure that it continues in that direction. So while we're in this purgatory of having a world where um, all the isms and all the is are there, uh, we have to realize that there's this world where these children think that the world is fair and a good place and we want to continue that trajectory. And so I think language is a really important part of uh, this conversation, um, empathy and understanding where they're coming from and also representation. I think with our department specifically, we are out in the community a lot and we have 20 teaching artists, very diverse in all sorts of aspects. Um, uh, and so I think it's really important to present a space that looks like the world that they think they're living in, that they are living in. And so, um, you know, we want to send a teaching artist into a community who uh, looks and feels and speaks like, like the students and the, and, the, and the families that live there. And I think that that is uh, something that we should continue doing. It's a hard topic to do. It's very new and exciting. Uh, our department um, grew very quickly from the very beginning. I wasn't there during the Big Bang, is what I'm calling it, but uh, um, our director was. Um, not to say that he's old. If you're listening to this, I'm sorry, Freedom. <laughs> um, but he was there in the beginning, and he was a, a really good part of uh, curating that program and very selective about the people who are going to represent this department who really are representing this community and the youth are included. And I think uh, their voices have always been there. And uh, growing up, I rarely saw um, persons of color and especially Asian, uh, Asian Americans on television um, in a good light. And so it's really nice to see that that's no longer the world that we live in and that people are trying really hard to create this world that we should be living in. Um, so language and empowerment. Yep. 
Um, so going along the same lines of, of language, I think like accessibility and not just in the sense of um, like POC and, and students with disabilities or whatnot, but um, I know something like we talk about like teens are flaky and like it's really hard. I feel like there's kind of like one of two types not to put labels on things, but like you have those teens like me who are like we're super involved and so busy that like when we weren't able to make something it was because we were so busy and then there's those other teens that it's just difficult, there's circumstances beyond their control of them being able to attend events or get there and something I think that really helped my Myself and peers um, was like having accessibility to public transportation, being able to get bus passes. Um, and so, depending on what community you're in, there are very simple things that I think helped a lot of my peers that weren't able to make it um, because not all of us, you know, were able to have our parents drop us off or get picked up or things like that. So, um, I think that was something that was super helpful was just having bus passes or just being offered the option that there are multiple ways to get to where we need to go um, and kind of really problem solving with the teens and figuring out, okay, how can we get you there? Like for TCG, like, okay, how can we make this happen? Um, and we fundraised, we got GoFundMe accounts, we learned how to set them up, we reached out to all the actor friends, every theater professional that we knew at the time um, as, as high school students. Um, and along the same lines, having a smaller sort of incentive. Like we had some programs, we had a program through Teen Council um, where we were offered the opportunity to go into schools with teaching artists and um, it was like a slam poetry, the slam poetry um, workshops that we did and there was a small uh, monetary incentive. So as teens, we were able to get paid a little bit to do, to do work um, for the Teen Council. I know that's not always feasible and possible, um, but I think for teens that are so busy or that are torn between, they really wanna be involved, but they need to get a job, they need to save for college, very practical things, um, having some sort of monetary incentive, I know, was super helpful um, for a lot of my peers who really, really wanted to be involved, really wanted to be there, but that was just a setback that they had. Um, and I know there was another, there was a gala event where they had some of us come in and they wanted us to share about our experiences about um, the theater company and teen council and how it had helped us and they wanted us to perform. Um, and they asked us to come in for rehearsals and they were able to give us a small stipend for that. Um, so just small ways, small incentives for those teens that are super busy like myself who are like, I really wanna be involved, but there's only so much uh, that I can do um, saving for college and, and all these other things. Um, so just having that accessibility in terms of thinking, troubleshooting those problems and working with the students, if there is flakiness, if there is kind of a deficit and okay, 100 teens came to this event and now only five are coming, but really asking the youth, asking them, what's going on, like can, how can we help you? And really getting at the root of what that is. And sometimes they're out of our control, but sometimes they're things that can be, we can work together and, and solve those problems. Um, one thing that we uh, recognize with our theater with um, the other part of my job, which is the presenting and the programming, is that I was finding that um, uh, the, on, uh, elementary school age kids for field trips coming into our theater was no problem. We could get 1,500 kids through our door in one week. The teachers would contact us. They would want pre or post show workshops after. We'd send teaching artists out into the schools. It was great. We were winning. We were like, yeah, we're, this is great. I'm good at my job. But I noticed <laughs> that whenever I tried to put on a show for uh, a TYA, and this was by a professional uh, theatre, a TYA prof uh, professional theatre company that was geared slightly older kids, maybe upper, middle, or high school. I was struggling to get the, the audience in. I was struggling to get the school audiences, and I was going out into the schools and I was trying to meet with the teachers, and I was talking to them about, I've got this idea, I'm gonna, I'm gonna program this show. It's based on a, it's based on a book. Will you bring them in if it's based on a book? You know, I was, you know, whatever it took, I was like, I'll do it. And they were like, well, we want to, but we've got testing and we've got this and we've got that. And, and I was just like, oh, man. And so what we've tried to do, not for this coming season, but um, I've committed to, to us and our staff that for the following season, we're going to try and either commission a show or book a show that we're going to tour into the high schools, whether it's a small scale production, which is when I was at the National Theatre in London, we often did with our Shakespeare piece. Um, we often took one, you know, we had one piece in our, in our main theatre that we bust in, or people took the tube, or that we brought them to the field trips, but then we always had one small pr uh, pr uh, touring piece that we took into local schools, and it was set up in the corner of the dining hall, and they would do a big pre-show workshop, and then they would see um, the performance, and then we'd do a talk back, or we'd do something afterwards. So, um, for me, um, I, we had to make that shift a little bit, and, we'll, and it's not easy to do. It, it, it's really expensive, and it, it's going to take a lot of staff, and it's going to take a lot of organization, and it's finding that right uh, company that are willing to do that and not maybe be on a stage with 
you know, a, a soundboard and lighting and a crew, but yet, you know, in a dine hall, like, we're going to shove the tables over there. You know, so it's trying to make the best of what we've got, but it's recognizing that that is the age group that are crying out for this kind of work and that we've got to shift a little bit our focus to make sure that they're accessible to it. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that we're doing. Great. Um, I'll just add one thing, which is that um, in our conversations about empo empowering youth voice for these types of programs, it's important for us to define, like, really who, whose voice, what age group are we talking about? What is the type of program we're talking about? We are not, we're all, you know, small arts organizations. We're never going to be all things to all people. And by trying to do that, I personally believe that you are not able to, de uh, to deliver on the greatest program you could by trying to serve all. So one, define that and then realize that all of your constituencies that you're working with have expertise that they're bringing to the table. So if you're focusing on working with high school youth, then there's real knowledge there in the same way that there's real knowledge in your staff and it's about collaborating together for the best program to meet what your goals are. But it's um, difficult if you're trying to um, approach it, one, for what I think Evelyn was talking about before in terms of uh, trying to fulfill what some mandate is from the funder, um, or from someone who is so far away from the community that you're working with that they don't actually have an understanding of the community's needs and wants and desires, which they need to have an opportunity to express themselves. So it's really about creating that space. Great. Thank you for sharing that. It's interesting. I had a uh, you know, we were looking at doing some neighborhood programs. This is a little bit of a sidebar, but it does relate, I promise. Um, <laughs> we were doing um, a youth after-school programming in a specific neighborhood, in the Imani neighborhood. And uh, um, our youth that we were working with, we kept hearing them talk about how they don't have enough adult positive interactions in their life. I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. At the same time, there was a funder that was saying, hey, we're going to be cutting the funding for these youth programs because we're going to be focusing specifically on neighborhood programming and on community engagement programming. I was like, Okay, so then I was getting a directive to think about what could we do. And I'm not, I don't like that perspective of, oh, a funder's dictating what we should be doing, so let's do it that way. So I took the grant application to the community, and I said to a couple of the community leaders at small organizations within that community, does this make sense? This is what I'm hearing from the youth that we're working with in this neighborhood. Does it make sense to develop something with you all as partners and have it be multi-generational where we're working with the youth, but we're also working with this? And through that, we've also, you know, considering that, that, you know, just some of the learnings from when, when Abby was with us too about that monetary incentive was really important. So we make sure that in those applications, in every grant application, we are including part-time youth leader positions. These are paid positions. Um, and making sure that, you know, they're there f for that entire process. Um, so it was interesting to me just kind of thinking about that, that shift of focus for us and how um, those, those conversations of where we're at the table with these applications and how do we also include then youth in those applications for grants, you know, from that writing perspective. Um, so as we're shifting our after school programming and looking at what is the content of what we're gonna be delivering next year, you know, I had a teen council member who was doing his internship with us as well, um, work with us on editing this grant, on providing some of this research. You know, so from that beginning, how are they involved and how can we empower their voices? But then at the same time, not having that pendulum swing so far, because I've also realized when I try to empower our teen council too much, that they have no idea, you know, like, oh, just make the decision, it's fine. They're like, we don't know how to make the decision, you know, and that reminder of, oh, yeah, wait, they don't know what they don't know. They haven't been in the same world, you know, of, of program development and planning. So how can we make sure that we're providing those options and seeking their guidance in a responsible way on that direction as well? Um, Great. Does anybody else want to add anything to just where where youth come into this process of development? 
Um, kind of going off of the grant writing thing, because I actually recently did an um, apprenticeship where I was helping edit grants, because I told my boss, asked me, what do you want to focus on? What do you want to learn? And I said, grant writing. Um, so myself and three other apprentices in Chicago were, um, were helping edit a grant. But another uh, factor I was thinking about is the marketing aspect and the, the, reach, the outreach to actually bring the youth in um, and involving them in that. But again, not too much. I know like that was a huge challenge I feel like when I was in teen council is, okay, we're trying to recruit our peers, but our peers are doing all these other XYZ activities and we were just at a loss for like where to where to start. I remember like our first uh, masquerade ball fundraiser and myself and another friend from our high school invited like everyone we could think of that we that we knew to this masquerade ball um, and the masquerade ball ended up being half half of the attendees I think attended my high school just because we had asked so many people um, and then years later we had more and more people but since we had such a small council and we had such limited options of even who to invite, we didn't even know where to begin. So finding that balance and really just evaluating the size of your teen council, the size of your group, and what they are capable of doing, and what we can put in their hands and what we shouldn't, I know that was always such a tricky question because we'd be empowered and we'd be told, you know, invite your friends, invite your friends, we wanna, but we, at a certain point, there was no one left to invite or we, we couldn't, you know, our friends were involved in other things, they had prom, they had exams and whatnot. Um, so finding that balance between the marketing and the outreach and bringing those teens in and maybe having the professional staff go in, you know, ahead of time and prep. I know something that the rep really helped do is anytime they would have any sort of workshop, they would always like put in a plug for teen council and say, and we have this side thing that's teen council and they would explain it a little bit. And so hopefully that drew in some students. So really having um, the your theater organization prep ahead of time and go in and find some teens to begin with so you have somewhere to start and so you're also empowering them to go out and outreach but it's not all on them it's not solely on them to bring in um, people because eventually we graduate and then you know there's this constant turnover with teens um, so the bigger and the stronger the better because we're all going to bring a different role we had one teen council member who moved away and when I was president, I think it was my junior or senior year of high school, he was sending me a um, marketing plan, like from, from, I think he was in Boston at the time, or Colorado, and he wanted to be involved so badly, and we were good friends from high school, and so he's like, here, I really wanna help you guys, I know you've gotten smaller, people are leaving, so he sent us a marketing plan to use as like a junior in high school that we tried to use. Um, so really finding that balance of, of bringing in the youth ahead of time so that we have somewhere to begin, but then giving us the choice and the, and the tools to help us and equip us to be able to market and, and bring in more teens because we don't know everyone. There's only so many teens we know. Right. <laughs> Wait, you don't know everyone? I don't understand. <laughs> and they're involved in so many other things. <laughs> so this actually is a really great segue into my next question for you all. Um, beyond education programming, where do you see youth voice being incorporated into your theaters? How do they get involved in marketing, in development, in artistic programming, in, you know, in community engagement if you're a separate department or if it's the same? Um, you know, so how do you see teens starting to infiltrate in other areas and influence other areas in your theaters? Um, so we, uh, We've had volunteers um, as part of the Old Globes program for a very long time, but they're, uh, they're there in a manner of being ushers and uh, patron services, et cetera. And so um, since I've been brought on, I've been tasked with uh, curating our volunteer program from the community engagement standpoint. And those, those volunteers are um, slightly of a different breed because we want them to be able to uh, speak back and have a two-way conversation with those that they're engaging with when they're out in the community. It's not just a thank you, here's your seat, and that's it, have a good show. Uh, we want to make sure that it, it's a continuous conversation about um, what it is that they're witnessing, did they like the show, um, and so we have uh, an something called Breaking Bread, which is when we bring people in to um, hear their voices, and these are obviously adults, but eventually we'd like to bring in the student voices that have been coming through our programs um, and curating those, those, those uh, relationships that we've already started to build. And so, for example, we would love to bring in the studio alumni who are now um, young adults. They're in college. Maybe they've graduated by now if they've been in the program a lot longer. Uh, and so they would be the ones that would fill this awareness gap that I think is missing from these marketing departments that say, I think they'll love this show, but really did they ask a student about it? Um, and so I think 
uh, that awareness gap needs to be filled by the voices that we're trying to seek, and that is the students. And so we have a lot of participants, and I'd love to um, spend my time you know, reconnecting with them, bringing them back in, and really having them guide what we're doing. Uh, we are on a couple of councils, um, the Creative Youth Development. Um, there is a conference in San Diego called the uh, Arts Amplifying Youth, where it's planned by teens, created by teens, and only teens are invited. We're not even allowed in the room except for a handful of people. And that's really amazing. Some adults can't even do that, you know? So, um, <laughs> So it's really awesome and I'd love to connect with them because they really are the future and if you give them a platform earlier, then they'll feel more empowered and um, innovation is all about taking risks. And I think when you take those risks, it is very scary, but the results uh, are, are very rewarding. And so sometimes you really just have to put yourself out on a limb and trust the people who will eventually be running our future. Um, kind of in the same regard in terms of uh, marketing, just really providing them, not even just marketing, just exposing them to the different departments at your theater beyond the education departments so that they have those options and they know they're out there, um, whether that's ushering, volunteering. I know like a lot of our teens um, on the council, we'd volunteer for the annual gala, so we got to see that side of things. Um, so just exposing them and, and from the gr having that groundwork of this is what our theater is, this is what we do, these are our different departments, and then if it's out there, they've seen, they've seen the options, and that way before they even are interested in shadowing or having a mentorship or um, going to these events before they even know, they need to know what's out there and what their options are, so just um, showing them those different departments. I think it goes back to something you said earlier in terms of um, asking them what they want and what they're interested in and providing space for that. I mean, I think that that's kind of the bottom line across the board. Um, I know that um, when I was at the rep, we had a program where um, the teen council uh, young adults were mentored by the fellows so that we had the kind of multiple levels of learning for, that was cross-departmental uh, that uh, was very fruitful. I know that now at Looking Glass, it's interesting because we have this additional culture in that, so we're an ensemble-based company. Um, the ensemble members are in a place where their lives where most of them have teenagers. So there is this extra level of, all, you know, 20 or so teenagers who grew up at the theater, who most of them are interested in being artists and create um, their own work where it is an accepted part of the culture, but it's this um, interesting organism because it is uh, this like elevated status because they're um, children of ensemble members and so figuring out how do we connect that with what's going on in our education programs in a way that feels organic and authentic um, and dynamic and fun is something else that we're we're talking about because there is already like something in the DNA there and it's just about how are we weaving that across the entire organization. So that's another thing for us to work on. Um, and I think any time we talk about um, youth voice and internship programs, it's funny, um, Alma's here. Alma and I used to be at the New Victory Theatre together and um, in New York City, and I, you cannot talk, have this conversation about internships without mentioning the New Victory Theatre and their incredible um, internships where they have young people placed in every single department of the theatre and they're paid and they're trained and they're doing real work. Um, and, um, you know, just a funny side note, personal story, I had an intern um, when I was in the education department who shadowed me um, for however many weeks um, and then she went back home to London. She was actually an inter on an international internship program. She went back to London, and then when I moved back to London several years later, she was then my boss at the National Theatre, <laughs> which, uh, you know, was incredible and awesome, and that shows um, the level of program th that the new Victory Theatre has. And I know that members of uh, their education department are going to be at TCG later on this week, and if any of you are interested, you know, I'm not the one that should be speaking for their program. They are, and uh, it's, like, mind-bogglingly good. So... You know, I think that they're worth just dropping in, right, Alma? We, got it. we were just talking this morning. We were like, they're the Rolls Royce, you know, and that's how, they, and they're very generous and they will share any uh, program information and details with you guys and, um, you know, uh, just reach out to them because Lindsay in the education department is, you know, is phenomenal. So I, I'm just giving them a shout out. 
It's been interesting too over the last, I mean, we've had our team council for about nine years now and for having, you know, seeing the ones that become very involved and are just happen to like make the theater another home for themselves, you know, the more that they become present and infiltrated, not just in education, but then they start being seen by other departments, that's when we start getting questions from those other departments. So one of the things that we've set up now as a part of the teen council is that we have space for one teen to do a semester or year long internship where they job shadow every single department. Or we set up with them a, a plan for that job shadowing. What are you interested in? What do you want to learn more of? And then they have reflections that they have to do after that initial shadow. And then I'll go back to that department, depending on that reflection, say, hey, we need a follow up. You know, we need another shadow. They actually want to spend some time in the department. Could you use them as an intern for four weeks and then just be placed in development? You know, um, and now we start getting requests from like new play development saying, hey, can I have your, your high school intern for a while? You know, so I need a couple weeks, I've got a couple projects, and that would be a really great perspective to have. You know, so it's just been an interesting um, uh, way for us to start introducing those teens. But then also it has resulted into actual jobs too, that aren't just me setting up jobs, but somebody saying, hey, we need a receptionist. You know, is there a teen council member that would be a receptionist? You know, is there somebody that can work in the ticket office? Is there some, you know, so looking at how they start becoming involved in other departments, just because we're seeing that their presence is demonstrating their responsibility and commitment to our theater, as well as the future of our theater. So that's another, another interesting way to do that. In yeah, exactly. Um, so one uh, final question, and then I do want to spend some time with some Q&A here. Um, one final question is just upon reflection of your, we have a, a lot of years of working with youth um, or being a youth as a part of programming and growing into your own educational development. Um, what are some of those takeaways? What have you learned about theater today, the future of theater, and where where we are moving towards, what should we be moving towards as a field based off of the learnings that we've had in Youth Voice? So that's a big question, you know? It's a, it's a pretty big question, you know? But one of the things that, like, I'll start while you're all thinking about that question. You know, one of the things that I've, I've been learning is just seeing how, I, maybe it's just at our theater, but maybe it's it's elsewhere too, because I feel like these conversations and the years of having even youth at TCG conferences has been a really interesting thing for us to be taking from them as well as as working with them and hopefully mentoring them. Um, you know how how is this a reciprocal relationship with the youth and not just about us? You know, oh, we need your your perspective because we're trying to bring younger people in our seats, right? But how are you actually ingrained into every decision that we are making? How are we taking that into consideration when we're even looking at new plays that we're developing at our theaters, if you have a new play development department? Um, how are we looking at that in terms of just programming what the shows we're doing? You know, how are the youth able to read some of the scripts that we're considering for season planning? How do you structure that? Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that I'm just considering and thinking, and I feel like in the last decade, you know, with community engagement becoming so central as well, and education programming alongside that, I, I think we're just becoming more and more central, and I wonder how much of that has also been influenced by youth being at the table. I'm not sure if it's going to answer any of it or part of it, but um, what that made me think about, um, I guess, is representation of youth on stage. Um, so the project is um, the young people are predominantly. Uh, youth of color, and um, we work with about 200 volunteer artists a year, and one thing that I've been very cognizant about and focused on is making sure that the artists who are volunteering reflect also and represent the young people and that they look like them and they um, that we have a specific, very diverse um, group of volunteers who come in and work with our young people because I think it's really important that they see themselves 
in these adults as well. Um, and one thing that we also, I'm you know, blessed to be in New York City where there is so much the access to theater. Um, and so what we try and do regularly with our young people is take them to see shows in New York City. Um, and we do have a lot of wonderful relationships with a lot of different theaters who offer us comp tickets. Um, and honestly, one of my favorite things to do is go to a student matinee or a show with young people because they are so incredibly honest in their reactions to what they're seeing. And I and and then we always, you know, with young um, with student matinees or whatever it is, student shows. There's often a talk back. And the, the thing that I see in a lot of these artists is that they always often reflect that they one are so excited to have youth in the audience, and two, they're so nervous, they get more nervous than a regular show because they know that these young people are gonna be honest and are gonna react, that you will hear how they're feeling in the moment. Um, they do not hold back. But, um, and so we've been making an effort to bring our young people to see shows that would excite them and not just, you know, when, when I first talk to my young people about what they think theater is, it's like, you sit in, a, you sit in the theater, there's an audience, you don't say anything, you can barely relate to what's happening, and then we try, so then I'm thinking, what kind of shows can we take them to where we can break that? And so the last show we went to, there, we, we started in a park and marched through the park, in a, like, it was like a um, New Orleans themed band, and we marched through into the theater and we stood the whole time and we danced, and they were like, Natalie, this is theater? I was like, yeah, this is theater too. So also like breaking their, allowing them I think theater needs to move forward and think about how to be more accessible and more relatable to young people because they are smart as hell and they know they know things and they know how to relate to things and it's important for them to feel it and have an experience that's not always the most traditional kind of theater. So I guess also breaking what traditional theater looks like. No, that made me think of uh, kind of going going along the same lines as that idea of immersive theater, and um, I think something that specifically millennials and and youth uh, is that idea of attention span, that idea of social media, and the quick the story, the idea of watching a story in ten seconds, moving on, and bouncing from idea to idea to idea, thought to thought, faster and faster. Um, and so something that I think theater that that new theater um, has kind of embraced and encompasses that idea of a lot quicker attention span, maybe moving from, um, whether it's physically moving from room to room or whether it's incorporating social media on a screen as part of the show, um, but really just adapting and utilizing social media um, and that idea of immersive experiential um, theater that I think excites youth and, and younger people. Uh, something that I think Rachel had mentioned earlier is to define this community. And I think we've, we're talking about representation and really community can mean a lot of things, right? You can relate um, because you're part of the LGBTQ community. You could relate because of your gender. Uh, you can relate because of your socioeconomic status. There's, there's really a large spectrum of what that community is defined as. And I think we need to break this mold of what we think theater goers look like and how they um, what their socioeconomic status is. We need to break the mold of what volunteers look like. We have a, a very nice, robust docent program, but they're very um, veteran volunteers. <laughs> and and I don't, you know, and I, I get volunteers who are like, I'd love to be a docent, but I'm not retired and I'm not 16. And I was like, no, no. And so I, I feel like we need to fight this it's very true, and we, we need to fight this language that um, persists and uh, let them know that just because the way things were aren't always the way they need to be uh, moving forward, uh, to make sure that that is inclusive language allows them to realize that these opportunities are also there for them, um, and they need to be encouraged to take it, and I think that that um, that little bit of action needs a little encouragement, a little bit of oiling on our side, because if we don't do that, then we'll continue to get these older, retired, which we love, we love, and they do a wonderful job for us. We have thousands of volunteers, and it's great. Um, but, you know, one day they'll retire from volunteering, and we'll need a, a younger base to continue forward. Um, sorry to all my volunteers. <laughs> Okay, so my brain's going lots of different places. But, um, you know, one thing that I'm struggling with that does get back to your question is that, and, and I'm truly struggling with as a new ED in an organization, uh, our tickets are too expensive. Like, we have created, uh, or, or oh, I don't even know if it, how to best say it, there are too many barriers to entry. 
And at the same time, we're not fully compensating people for the work that they're doing. Like the cost of what we do is so expensive. Um, and with the way that our financial model works, it's like, well, you're gonna get it from fundraising or you're gonna charge your ticket prices. And so we're stuck. And that's a huge problem because you know what? I am a strong believer that um, you know, uh, particularly if you're looking at middle school and teenagers, they should, they should have the opportunity to go to any type of art that they could be interested in. I want to encourage them to be cultural omnivores and with no judgment placed on what they attend and consume and find meaning and joy in. Uh, but if we have created a system where you have to be from a certain socioeconomic class in order to participate, then we're creating something that is either getting smaller and smaller, not very interesting to me, and also not sustainable in any way and, and not forward thinking. So while, you know, I think that there's actually a, a big economic piece to this um, that uh, I know people have been talking about for a long time, we've been always talking about all that, but still it's getting worse. And that figuring out how to have the experience of attending a live performance is another thing that one can do on the weekend with their friends is something that I think is vital to our um, success as an industry and as artists and for engagement um, and also for human beings to be able to have a space where we're collectively convening together and engaging with ideas and thoughts and people who might be different than us. So there's a, there's a lot in there that I think mirrors uh, what we need to be addressing within our art institutions and also mirrors uh, what's going on in the world around us. Um, great. So with that, we have about 15 minutes left for a Q&A. So if anybody has any questions for a group. Yes, Kati. Um, so uh, you've very eloquently talked about some of your strategies on the um, institutional side for um, you know, for inclusion inclusion of youth voices, whether it's bus passes or um, representation of docents or teaching artists, could you speak a little bit about some of the strategies? It's you've talked about the sort of the what and the how. Can you talk a little bit about the who, like how you get a um, diverse group of young people in the room, and that includes um, young people with disabilities. It's a super tricky question, um, but just like a brief way is just like, um, what's the right word? Recycling? Recycling your youth, like over the years, like if you've got a teen council, bringing those students back. I mean, like Jenny's brought me back and now I'm teaching for her. Like just like, and there's been multiple, like she mentioned, like there's been receptionists who um, have worked on the teen council. So if you already have a youth program in place, just like bringing those youth back again and again, um, if, they, if they do, you know, represent, um, because yeah, that's super important. So I think if, they, if they've already grown up in the program and they've already um, kind of had that like training, I guess, um, that's a super good way. So to be completely honest with you, so at the 52nd Street Project, one of the main things that we do with our young people is we take them away on trips. So um, the component with all of our big theater programs, like if during the playmaking program, the first thing we do, we take them away for a weekend on a writing retreat to get them out of the city. We go to the country somewhere outside, upstate or somewhere. Um, and everything's free, of course, for the young people. And we, um, and they, we just spend the weekend uh, writing and then like bowling or whatever the afternoon activity is. And that's why our kids want to come to our program. <laughs> Like these 10 year olds are like, I'm not trying to be an actor. I hear that there's a ping pong table and we go to um, the Hamptons over the weekend, which is ridiculous, but, 
But um, it's also a way for them to have another experience outside of New York City and to um, allow them to experience and to write in a different space um, or rehearse in a different space. And so, and we're not, we know that we're not here to make actors or help build that, but we're here to have them build community and relationships and creative skills. So, our, we always joke, we're like, they're not here for the theater. <laughs> they're here because we're going to take them away for a bit. Do you need volunteers for that Hampton trip? I mean, I've never been. Yeah, I was going to say that um, a lot of our uh, youth, pro the way that we attract youth programming is um, word of mouth. Like people that have been part of our programs, they tell their friends. Um, we also have an in-school program where we're out in schools during the term times. So we talk to teachers about any kids that they might know of that are either taking part in the pre and post show workshops, come to see the theater, or if they know of any other kids and anywhere else in the school. You know, the teachers are incredible resources. They know their kids really, really well. Um, you know, and then we might reach out that way. Um, the way that we get them into the theater with field trips is all our tickets for our school matinees are free, and we also provide bus-ins for all the schools. We had to do that through grants and fundraising, which was really, really hard, but that's the only way that we could do it. Um, the schools just could not, uh, you know, we've, we've partnered with the city. We're part of something called the Cultural Passport Program, where schools um, will reach out to, the, to them and say, we really want to do field trips, and then they will kind of make that connection with us. Um, so that was like the schools and teachers. And then once you're in there talking to the people that work with the young people themselves, they become your advocate. And so if they've got a kid, uh, we've also become, um, in our um, summer camp programs, we have um, a lot of kids with um, additional needs. And that started where they were just coming to us, uh, the families were coming to us, or a teacher would refer them to us. We decided that we had, um, you know, families that were interested, kids that, you know, love the arts. We all know that, you know, there's so much research and studies out there that sometimes, uh, often kids with um, additional learning needs uh, get so much out of the performing arts, whatever that is. And so that we started training our staff, sending them out to do training so they can have strategies. Um, and then we be, be got a reputation and then we went for a city grant um, called the Sassy Grant, which can give us money to help support these uh, young people while they're in our programs. So a lot of it kind of started word of mouth and just getting other community leaders where your theater is to be your advocates, to invite them in, to watch what you do. Because it's not, you don't always have to ask people, come in and then we're gonna ask you for money. Sometimes you, we want you to just come in, see what we do, and then just talk to everyone you know about us. And um, you know, just talk to everyone that you know. And maybe somewhere along the line, someone would like to give us some money, which would always be helpful. But that, that's not always the way. Sometimes, it, you know, Miami's a very word of mouth town. Um, so that's one thing that we do. I think a huge thing is meeting them where they're at, too. Um, meeting the students that you're hoping to get into the doors where they're at, whether it's through various communities, whether it's partnering with youth-serving organizations that are not theaters. Most of my partners are not involved with arts at all. Most of it is after-school programs, youth programs that have nothing to do with theater. And we might be that one arts partner with that group. Um, also connecting to my in-school programs, which we haven't talked about at all really, is in-school programming. But during those in-school programs, we, pr we talk about these other programs, these other ways to get involved. So maybe we have this group of 35 students in this classroom that have absolutely no desire to be in the arts, but they're a part of this in-school program because they're required to. But then there's that one student that it's like, actually, I'm kind of interested in this. You know, so how do we, we provide them with the information that this is a pathway, that there are ways for you to get involved beyond this particular school program? Um, and this is what we hear in communities as well, is you have to build those relationships. You have to start with those relationships because they're not gonna trust you, particularly at white institutions, right? And Milwaukee Rep right now is a very white institution still. You know, so how are we able to invite people in and make them feel welcome? Um, but it really starts with, with being there, being in their communities and starting there versus starting with us. Evelyn. Thank you all so much. I have 10 questions, so I'm gonna have lunch with each of you and ask the, 
the questions, but the one that's probably the most pressing is this idea of compensation that, Abby, you brought up. And I'm curious to know, we have young people right now who are advocating for minimum wage um, to work, uh, particularly in the True Colors Troop. And in Boston, that's $12 an hour, right? And so uh, through the writing process, we're able to do that. But once they go on tour, it's hours and hours and hours of work. Um, and it's much above uh, what we can afford. So I'm curious to know, uh, of your organizations, who uh, is compensating um, young people for their work and how you're doing that? One thing that we do, in our, uh, this is with our musical theatre camp, which is a little bit different to your structure, but we um, got a city grant, I mentioned it, um, where it gives us support for kids with additional needs, but it also they offer um, us uh, financial means to um, offer scholarships. And so we might not compensate um, in an hourly rate, but we may offer them a scholarship to take part in the program. So that's one thing that we found successful. Uh, slightly similar, we um, partner with After School Matters in Chicago where they pay uh, youth to attend our so summer programs. So we're able to do it that way, but beyond that, we don't, we're, we're also struggling. We, we don't have the resources to be able to compensate, which is a problem. Along the same lines, um, our studio program is the only program um, that is a paid program. Uh, it's a tuition-based program and uh, we offer scholarships, and it's not an unlimited amount of money uh, that we can offer them, but it's uh, that barrier that you were talking about earlier, Rachel, where um, this access used to be tuition only, uh, we didn't offer scholarships, and everyone had to audition, and so that's in addition to the, the money barrier, there was a talent barrier too, and so now we've transitioned recently, what since our department has started, into um, a none to tons kind of experience, so you can come in with zero experience, but have that little inkling, like maybe I'd like to be an actor, um, to the person who's aspiring to move to New York one day and become a Broadway star, and we wanna include everybody in that, in that communication, um, and so we do offer the scholarships, and I have this wonderful, conversation with our development department and we were talking about scholarships and suddenly they're like, you know, why don't we just make it all free? And I go, oh my God. And so it's not something we would have imposed upon them because we don't want to create more work for our, our, our the departments, but it's so great to feel supported by them. Um, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to add was our artistic department has a, a really robust internship program and the interns usually move on and get promoted from within and then they begin getting fairly compensated on a, a um, the organizational chart the way they should be paid, just like every other employee. Um, one is going on to becoming an assistant director, another one um, uh, is starting to uh, follow the dramaturg, and so it's just it's just really nice that we're, we're collecting them from within and not going from without to show that loyalty to them. We do have a um, teen employment program at my organization, and, um, so, um, and it is a minimum wage, which is $15 in New York City now. Um, and so they are our um, after-school receptionists, our ushers, um, and um, homework helpers to support the younger. Um, we do after-school homework help every day after school. We do have an education department and some of our, our teens are homework helpers and help some of the younger kids with their um, homework. Um, and then in every theater arts program that we have, we also have a teen employee assistant who participates in the program. Perhaps they have done it a few years before and they act as like a class assistant to the teaching artists and they will be compensated for that. So we try and find different ways um, to give them opportunity, one, to be responsible and have a job and to, and to compensate them but, um, with our, uh, when they're performing or for the most part, it, it's tricky, it's tricky to pay them and um, luckily all of our programming is free but um, for them but, and our shows are free to attend but it's, um, it's something we always think about, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, when, when I was part of the council, I'm not sure, there, was, there wasn't a specific uh, compensation for being a part of the council, but um, kind of as you mentioned, like opportunities within the company, so like an uh, after school program, you could be like an assistant to a teaching artist, um, like I mentioned, uh, working at the gala, that was a stipend, um, so mostly stipend based when I was there, but. We try to incorporate that into our grant writing. So if we're writing a program, uh, a grant for a program specifically, then we incorporate either if it's stipend base or an hourly wage for teens. We also find um, the city partners, and Milwaukee Public Schools in particular has teen internship programs 
particularly in the summer, which is, Abby was a summer arts intern and was paid through us, but it was, um, we were reimbursed by the Milwaukee Public School System to be able to do a paid teen internship. We also have a program, um, a professional training institute, uh, where teens have free uh, master classes throughout the school year, and then it culminates in the summer with a full production where we are paying those actors as paid actors. Um, part of that now is, is paid for through that Milwaukee Public Schools Arts Internship Program, but also we raise a ton of money at our gala, and we have it earmarked in a separate fund specifically for engagement and education programming, and we use we allocate some of that fund to pay those interns, and we know that we're gonna have to replenish that fund with additional fundraisers, but that program is not covered by a grant. Are we done? Uh, Are we we, time? We're yeah. pretty much at time, unless there is one last burning question, I'm gonna say this has been amazing. Talk about putting kids at the center of our organizations and empowering, empowering them to make decisions and giving them opportunity to use their voice and grow into their voice. Please thank the panel with me. <laughs> Thank you and all. engage with our teens. There's 12 of them. Alliance, Berkeley Rep Center Theater Group, and Milwaukee Rep will all have teens. And they are doing a session tomorrow. Yes. Two o'clock tomorrow? Wonderful. That's great. Yes. On leadership. There you go. So learn Wonderful. from them. I love that, that it's actually incorporated into the conference proper. We are on a 15-minute break. We are going to start back here again promptly at 12 o'clock. We're having a bit of a later lunch, so this is just a quick... There's still a snack there. Use the